Tate Society. Tate Society, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet at the John Campus Show. Coming to you from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia. It is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, join us as we talk about our favorite things in the world. And look, YouTube let us connect a live stream today. We had a little bit of a technical problem yesterday. YouTube, for whatever reason, wasn't letting us live stream. But today, we're here and doing it. And joining me on this great Friday, we got a full house in here today. In the house today, actually under the roof today, is the one and only Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how you doing, sir? John, it's a great Friday. It's love is in the air, John. It's Valentine's Day, and you know, aren't you excited? Cupid's arrow strikes. Wherever. I've never, I've never liked Valentine's Day. I've, I've, I've never, I've never cared about Valentine's Day. What? But I'll tell you a story in a second. And also joining us here on this Friday with Joey Bishop, it's Aaron Cummings. Aaron, how you doing? Happy Valentine's Day. It's the day for lovers and for loving. And you know what? Just you don't have to necessarily love the one you're with. Just find someone to love. There you go. It's always that's always a good philosophy. So I'll tell you. I'm going to tell you a story about a quick Valentine's Day uh -oh. story for me. I've never cared about Valentine's Day. Never cared. Never, never cared. Now, years and years and years ago, uh, before I got married to Anne, I, w I actually got engaged to somebody before. And a uh, wonderful, awesome girl, actually. Wonderful, awesome girl. Her name was Holly. Is she and watching? Probably not, no. But um, I had no interest in Valentine's Day. And Valentine's Day came, came along. And uh, she didn't really have a, a big care for Valentine's Day either. And I remember I... We got together with her mom for a short period because we were giving something to her mom, whatever. And when Holly was out of the room, her mom asked me, so what did you get her for Valentine's Day? And I'm like, well, actually, I didn't get her anything for Valentine's Day. We're going to go out and eat. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a Valentine's Day guy. That turned into one of the worst arguments I've ever had with my at time because it ended um, with me finally saying to her mom, Listen, I totally appreciate what you're saying, but this is really none of your business, which is totally the wrong thing to say to a parent. Ooh. This is none of your business. But it's not. And then she screamed at me, yes, it is my business because she's my daughter and I love her and you're a jackass for saying that. And I'm like, okay. this is So ever since I really hated Valentine's Day, really hated Valentine's Day after that. So had you screw and off Valentine's Day. But had you and your fiance discussed, like, was she expecting a present? No. Did, then No, no, but it, and it's one of those things. Some people just love Valentine's Day. So to all of you suckers out there, happy Valentine's Day. Anyway, I'm not trying to yuck on anybody's yum. If you like Valentine's Day, that's great. But listen, we do have a lot of things we need to talk about here today, including a number of things off the top. So let's not waste any time and go into some of these stories right now. First of all, let's get started with this. Of course, one of the more popular shows, if maybe not arguably the most popular show on Netflix has been Stranger Things. People loving it. Of course, Stranger Things season three ended. The post credit had a little bit of a tease. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got, we got this. We've got Stranger Things season four. Just put out a one-minute teaser trail, actually a little bit shorter than a minute. Most of you guys have probably seen this by now. And, of course, it shows us what we suspected from the end of Season 3, that uh, uh, Hopper is still indeed alive, and he's on some Siberian work camp building railroads. So, really not a surprise at all. I mean, we all thought at the that end tease at Season 3, we all just assumed that was Hopper. I mean, we didn't know 100% for sure. So this little trailer just kind of gives us that clarification, that 100% confirmation. Rob, you saw this trailer for season four, and I know you like, you like this show. You like Stranger Things. But anyway, what do you think about this little teaser and the little revelation? Well, it's nice to know that, that Hopper's still alive. I, I think, I think what, what this does, though, is in my mind, it, I have many questions. Now the upside down is global. Can anyone anywhere on the earth access the, the upside down with the right technology? And if there's no 11 and there's no people that understand what the mind flare is, what else is in that world? I don't trust the Russians to protect the human race from the upside <laughs> down, John. And uh, it makes me nervous. It makes me nervous because we don't have the kids, man. They left. They're scattered to the four winds. And, you know, it would be kind of cool if the entire the entire season takes place in Russia with actors we don't know speaking in actual Russian and the whole thing is subtitled. Well, I'd be in. Sure, but this is the final season. 
They're yeah, going, yes. This is going to be the final season. You know, you're, they're they're not going to do the final season without the kids. I mean, that's scary. It's not going to be in. I don't think it's going to be in Russia. I think there's probably going to be one episode where he escapes out of Russia, comes back. I don't know. I'm just speculating here. Aaron, you had a chance to watch it. Uh, what did you think about it? And does it did it surprise you at all, or was it just what you were expecting? Well, I think it confirmed what we all assumed, and therefore knew about Hopper is that of course he's not dead of course he's just in Russia um, I love the new look I love a hairless Hopper I'm into that um, <laughs> you know uh, but but yeah I agree you can't do the show without the kids the kids are stranger things and um, and also you know as we've seen with other shows and as we may talk about later today the last season is always a hypothetical yeah, I, I I have it on pretty good authority though. They are they they they're they're killing it after four. I, okay. I, I mean I think that's okay. It's it's also a very, very expensive show for them to make. So I yeah. think they're looking to exit and, and honestly, I don't know what you can do now with Stranger Things. I, I really don't know how you keep this premise going in because even though I'll say this, even though season three was actually my favorite season. Season three was actually my favorite season. Mine too. But I also started feeling it getting worn out. I, I just, by the time it was done, I feel like, okay, I'm starting to feel like this is being drawn out a little bit, even though it was my favorite season still. So I'm all for one more, but I don't know where you can go with it after that. So I don't know. It'll be interesting. I want the Winona Ryder spinoff show. Winona Ryder doesn't work <laughs> enough as far as I'm I concerned. Agree. Winona uh, and Hopper. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I mean, she goes, that storyline go. Yeah, she goes to California in the 80s. You know, maybe she gets mired in cocaine use and becomes an agent like Sue Mengers or something and, and winds up at CAA and, and then it just turns Turns into a, a Hollywood show, but from the agency perspective, and winds up at CAA. So maybe that's just a totally different show and not a spinoff. So maybe Winona Ryder just—I mean, as she probably will, and as she probably has been getting many offers since Star Stranger Things, I'm sure that she will do something really exciting. I well, think it'd be—it could be great, you know, if she does something totally different, and uh, but in the Stranger Things universe. <laughs> All right. The question is, guys. What did you think about the Stranger Things? Were you surprised by it, or were you like a lot of us, where you uh, you were totally expecting that anyway? But still, it's nice to see. Jump down to the comments section below and leave us your thoughts. All right, with that down and out of the way, let's move on to the most joyous news of the day. The most joyous news of the day, ladies and gentlemen, all hail Lucifer. And I say that strictly in a television context. Darn. All hail Lucifer, ladies and gentlemen. Now, for those of you who know, I love the show Lucifer. Tom Ellis's Lucifer is my, I'm not saying Lucifer is my number one favorite show on television, but his portrayal of the character Lucifer Morningstar is my favorite character on television. I can just, I can watch that character sit down in a room and have a conversation with somebody and I can watch that for a full hour. And I'm, I'm totally good. I love this show. Now, the show got canceled on Fox. Netflix came along and saved it. We already got one season, and then they said they were going to give us one more season, to which it was bittersweet because, ah, damn, only one more season of Lucifer. Season five is going to be the final season, they said. But hey, thank you, Netflix, for giving us two more seasons. Well, hold on a second, because this isn't coming from some fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants blog or some idiot know-nothing YouTuber. Uh, this is actually coming from TV Line, which has put out a report saying that they have learned that Netflix is in talks with Warner Brothers to extend Lucifer into a season six. Now, what they wrote specifically is this. Uh, how's this for a devil of a twist? Netflix is not ready to part ways with Lucifer. TV Line has learned exclusively that Netflix is in talks with Warner Brothers Television to extend the hellacious drama's lifespan beyond the previously announced and forthcoming fifth and final season, which Aaron Cummings, you appear in. Yes. In the fifth, the fifth and... Well, let's just call it not, not, not the final season. Let's call it the next season now. Uh, Netflix and Warner Brothers have yet to officially comment on the buzz. So, uh, clearly, you know, this is going to put me into all sorts of uh, geeky happiness rage. Um, I absolutely love this news. Now, look, the first question that comes to mind for me is, well, if they plan to wrap this up, you know, how do you do another season after that if you've already planned this season to wrap it up? Well, there is precedent for that. I bring to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I submit into evidence a show by the name of Magnum P.I. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you may remember it. I was young, but I still remember because this one season of Magnum P.I. ended and it was supposed to be Magnum P.I. dying. Magnum was supposed to die. And it even ended, Rob, 
with Magnum, kind of the spirit of Magnum PI with like what looked like heavenly clouds in front of him, looking back and smiling at his friends who were still alive and walking into the light. But then they decided, ah, you know what, let's bring it back for another season. And he survived and they brought it back. Anyway, so it, it all depends on where you're going with this. Look, again, to me, the thing I love about Lucifer, unlike Stranger Things, see, Stranger Things, I love the story. The thing about Lucifer is, my attachment to Lucifer is much like my attachment to Supernatural. I'm attached to the characters, right? So I really don't care what their storyline is. I just love the characters. And I love seeing the interaction of the characters and the evolution of the characters. So you can keep doing that as far as I'm concerned. So look, we should be very careful to point out that this is not official by any stretch of the imagination. But the very notion, guys, the very notion that Lucifer may get a season six might just redeem Valentine's Day for me. It just might, I can't say for sure, but it might just be good enough news that gives me a positive connection with Valentine's Day. Anyway, Rob, you hear about this. Number one, is it a good idea to bring it back for six? And number two, it's just a report right now, but could you see this actually happening? Dude, if we don't see a trade headline, whether it's on Deadline, Variety, or Hollywood Reporter, that says Lucifer is coming back for season six, Six six. Someone <laughs> is not doing their job as well far as played. I'm concerned. And I think that alone, just that headline alone that I would like to read uh, is worth bringing the season back for. But obviously it shows, you know, we've talked a lot on the show about how Netflix has this three seasons and done model. But if they have a real breakout hit, and I think they've probably been very surprised by the audience. And I'll bet you by being on Netflix, Lucifer's audience skyrocketed. And a lot of people were watching the show. They expected, like, my designated survivor, they bring it back on Netflix and they give it one season and retire it. But I think they've been overwhelmingly uh, surprised at the at the, the longevity of this show. People love the show. And I agree with you. You know, I could just watch that dude wander around and go grocery shopping. Yep. He's that <laughs> magnetic and that compelling. And that fu- he's that, that character is that much fun to watch. And so, you know, the, the very best part of the CW crossover, Christ on Infinite Earths, was the part where he pops up as Lucifer and he literally does nothing. And he had no implication on the show. It was just two minutes of him standing there talking to a couple people in front of him. And that was the best part of that crossover because that's what he brings to it. Aaron, you are actually going to be in season five. You make an appearance in season five Mm -hmm. and and you're actually pretty close to somebody who's one of the stars of the show and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, not to put you on the spot, but I'm gonna put you on the spot. Is would it be theoretically a good idea to go to six or would it be actually a good idea? You know what? Five's a great place to end. And do you think this actually could or will happen? Well, I mean, certainly the, a show being able to stay on the air is always a good thing. You know, when I, I worked on NCIS, I was talking to Mark Harmon and I said to him and we were uh, that was in the in season 16, I believe, and they had just gotten greenlit for season 17. And I said, you know, how has it how has it been, you know, being able to see the evolution of this show? And he said something really magical um, about the crew specifically. He said, I remember when we were, you know, potentially getting picked up for season three, somebody in the crew saying to me, hey, you know, I really hope we get another season because I'm hoping to buy a boat. And he said, now that same person (laughs) has multiple boats and a boat house. Um, (laughs) You know, he said, you know, we we get to see the the, the, not just the cast, but also the crew really invest um, in the show and be able to have something that they can rely on and come back to year after year and know they can put their kids through college and know that there's a safety net. So it's not just about the cast. It really is about the financial security in an industry that has absolutely no security at all. So it's always a good thing to keep people employed. I am always on the side of employment. That being said, um, when you announce that you're in your last season and they have, I mean, they only have, I believe, two episodes left to film of season five. So everyone that's involved, I'm specifically talking about the cast here, um, and I'm assuming many of the crew people, they're already looking for their next opportunity. They're, you know, it's pilot season right now. People are getting job offers. People are getting deals. People are, you know, working, you know, on their own productions and developing their own projects uh, outside of Lucifer. So to all of a sudden find out, oh, hey, guess what? You're still contractually obligated 
to do another season if we decide that we want to do it. Um, while it's, yes, a very good thing in some respects, there may be other offers that people have on the table that make that a little complicated. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but so couldn't you say that they were kind of in a similar situation when it was announced that the, I believe it was the third, yeah, the third season of Lucifer on Fox was going to be it and the show was canceled. And then all of a sudden, Netflix picked it up and saved it. So isn't aren't they kind of in the same situation here a little bit? No, and here's why. Um, having been on many shows that don't last, uh, <laughs> like my thing is I'm like, I can easily get a job as a series regular, but it's like the show always ends after one season or I die after one season. And so, uh, but, but there is a very big difference between when you're on a show for one or two seasons and the reach that show has and therefore the opportunity that come to you versus being on a show for five seasons, getting to a point of financial, like, you know, after one or two seasons, you're going, okay, my credit card bills are pretty much paid. Um, I have a nice down payment for a house, but I'm not totally ready to like, you know, I, I'm not totally ready to be done with this show. I need a little more financial security. My character also, when they canceled Lucifer, remember it wasn't the show closing, it was a cancellation. They didn't, They it wasn't like they planned on this is the last season. Right, right. They found out and so it was truncated. It was sort of, uh, it, it was almost like being dumped without really getting, you know, your full closure on both sides of the relationship. Now, everybody's, getting their closure. They're they're mentally preparing to move on. They're in a financial place where they can go, "Okay, I'm I'm okay for a minute and I'm ready to move on to something else." So this is a little bit different. That being said, I really hope that um, and I feel confident that Netflix, WB and everyone involved will make it something where uh, everyone will want to happily renew for a season six, um, feeling positive, not just about where they stand financially, but also, you know, at a certain point, you have enough money. It's more about the creative things. Where's my character going to go this season? I've already, you know, we've started to wrap this up. Where do we go from here versus just dragging it out? you know, dragging out a storyline that makes people not want to fall in love with it. And also remember, Rob was absolutely right. When a sh when the show went to Netflix, it gained a worldwide following that it didn't have before. And that makes a big difference. I I think everything you said is correct, but I just want them to bring it back. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Everyone does. All right, guys, question for you is, what do you think about this report? Number one, do you want them to bring it back for a sixth season or maybe feel like five would be a good wrap-up point? And number two, do you think this could actually happen? A lot is up in the air right now. Nothing has been confirmed. So jump on down in the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right. We got one more off the top. It was a busy day today for off the top stuff. But as you guys know, there is a new horrible looking film uh, that is coming. I believe it's, I think it's coming out of Disney+. Plus. It's called The Call of the Wild, a dog movie with a CGI dog. I, I just, I was in watching Sonic last night and they played a trailer for that and I just had my face buried in my hand. It's just, it, you're, if you're going to do a movie like that, do it with a real dog. Do it with a real dog. I know there are some things you can't do. I get it, but do it with a real dog. It looked terrible. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know. The movie might be great. It might be great. It looked terrible. However, while out promoting, and it was at the uh, premiere, they uh, or Disney Plus did a premiere uh, for The Call of the Wild. And they were talking to Harrison Ford, and apparently Harrison Ford let slip that they start shooting Indiana Jones 5 in two months. In two months. Now, there has been more Indiana Jones 5 buzzing going around the, the last number of weeks. We've been hearing a little bit more stuff coming out about it. People saying it's actually moving and happening. I am still officially in a place that I'll believe it when I see it. Like, I don't care if Harrison Ford said, I got to get up at 5 to start shooting Indiana Jones tomorrow. I'll still believe it when I see it. Because this has been dragged on for so long. This this movie was supposed to be in theaters already. So, whatever. But, I mean, this is one of the most tangible things we've heard about the development of this movie in a long time. Now, some people, understandably, are kind of of the mind right now that Harrison Ford may be a little bit too old to play this role. To me, it's all about the story. What are you having Dr. Indiana Jones doing? 
And, and like you could have him doing things that makes it fit perfectly well and works perfectly right and no problem. So I'm totally good with that. So I think he'd be fine. If you can have Arnold running around doing stuff at his age, if you got Sly still running around doing expendable movies at his age, why not Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones? Yeah, you you got to adjust it a little bit, but that's fine. I'd be all for it. I still don't know 100% that I believe this is happening. Rob, this is one of the most concrete things we've heard about this in a while. Is this movie actually happening? You know, John, with the entertainment landscape the way it is these days, I <laughs> believe anything can happen. Um, every day is like the surprise day on the Mickey Mouse Club. And you just <laughs> never know what's what's going on here. And I, I, I could see, yeah, I mean, this film has been in development for ages. So it, it, it wouldn't be surprising to me. I only hope, I mean, we haven't heard about Steven Spielberg's involvement. You know, he's right. in post on West Side Story, but... You know, remember when he was banging out Schindler's List and Jurassic Park in the same year? Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't put put it past him. I mean, I can't imagine he's not directing this, but I would like to see some more concrete evidence. And like you, I don't mind that you're. Look, we've got Star Trek Picard on the air. Picard, you know, in the in the in the yep. show, he's in in his nineties and he's off on a on an adventure. Why not send Indiana Jones on the same kind of adventure? I mean. It's it's not like it isn't Harrison Ford, and I like the idea of an Indiana Jones movie set in the '60s. You know, the first uh, uh, Temple of Doom and Raiders were in the in the in the '30s. Um, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and and actually all three of them. Uh, Last Crusade was in the '30s too. Then then Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was the '50s, and so now they would be into the '60s, and that interests me. What does Dr. Henry Jones do in the world of the Beatles, you know, and Acid Rock and Free Love and the Summer of Love and Civil Rights and the women's movement and the invention of the pill? I want to see an huh? adventure in that, <laughs> that in that milieu. That it is it is an adventure. At this Indiana point. Jones and Swinging London, maybe. Oh yeah. Oh, there you go. I mean, it is weird to think that he is going to be, I think, ten years. No. Yeah. I think he's gonna be ten years older in this next Indiana Jones movie than Sean Connery was playing Indy's dad yeah. in um, uh, Last, Last Crusade. Crusade. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's, it is kind of funny when you put it into context like that. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a, ca a James Bond cameo? Like, they don't have to call him James Bond. Oh, my God. But just like a British secret agent. <laughs> or maybe bring Henry Cavill back to play uh, Napoleon Solo from Man from Uncle. Or like, maybe Mike Myers from... Or, yeah. oh, my, my, <laughs> I mean, why you shagged me. <laughs> Aaron, do you think it's it's time? Well, first of all, should they even be doing another Indiana Jones? And, and if so, do you think it's actually going to happen? Because we've been hearing a lot of stuff. Harrison says they're shooting in two months. What do you think? I mean, I, I think that this is one of those franchises that brings up so many feel good warm fuzzies for people uh people enjoy people love indiana jones i love indiana jones i grew up on these movies and there and there is something also about harrison ford he is so charismatic no matter his age and i do agree that you know seeing him in the 60s of sort of like this uh you know laissez-faire free willing do as you do kind of attitude i'd love to see him with a you know a, a protege um, do, do we have an Indiana Jones son? Yes, Am Shia I, LaBeouf, but I, I really right. doubt they'll bring him back. Right, I agree, <laughs> but I'm, I, I would love to see... I would love to see Matt Bomer enter this world. I don't know why, but I kind of just feel like he and um, Harrison Ford would have a really exciting chemistry together. Um, it, not in a romantic way, but in a <laughs> you know, protege sort of way. Um, but yeah, I, I'm into it. I think Harrison Ford is one of those actors who has consistently um, aged like a fine wine. And while I don't expect him to be rolling under any, you know, quickly closing doors or uh, doing the 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 hot and fast action shots that we've seen in the past. I think that this will be a really fun ride, but I agree with you, John. I want to know what's the story. What are they what are the, what are we going to talk about and uh, like Rob, what what time zone are we in? What time period are we in? Yeah, no me? more please no more alien artifacts. Like like please no more alien. That's all I'm asking for. Guys, question is for you. Is it okay that they're moving? Like, are you excited about an Indiana Jones 5 at this point? And the second question is, do you think it's actually going to happen? I, I'm still in, I'll believe it when I see it kind of mode. What do you think? Jump on down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With all that down and out of the way, let's now move on to our main topics of the day. And how do we select our main topics here on the John Campy Show? Well, it's really rather simple. You see, you guys come up with them by going anytime, 24-7, over to www.thejohncampy.com 
thepantheashow.com slash contact. Once you guys get there, you're going to see a form. It's completely free. Fill it out, hit submit, and then maybe, just maybe, you might see your topic or question as a featured topic here on the John Campia Show. That down, let's get into main topic number one. And our first main topic today gets submitted to us by Gavin Gouge, who writes, Hey, John, Billie Eilish's No Time to Die song is out uh, now from the new James Bond movie releasing in April. Have you had a chance to listen to it yet? And if so, what do you think? Thanks and bring on the filthy. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And you know what? I did have a chance to listen to the new Billie Eilish uh, song. Of course, she's doing the new James Bond song. They announced that a number of weeks ago, and they've put it out officially now before the movie came out. Kind of good idea. Help pump up the movie and, and promote the, uh, the film and all that kind of stuff. So where are we at with this right now? Well, here's, here's where we're at. I started listening to this song last night, Rob, and right from the opening of it, I thought, like, even before the vocal started, now, this is just me, but I'm listening to it, I'm thinking, yeah, this is James Bond music. Like, just that that feel of it, and I could totally see, as the music was playing, I could totally see that montage of the silhouette of Bond walking through something, and I could totally hear it playing out in my head. And, look, I'm not, I'm not the biggest Billie Eilish fan in the world, but I'll tell you what, I listened to it. I kind of dug it. I I actually kind of liked it. I thought it was not bad because to me, again, it felt like James Bond music. But Rob, the important opinion in here is going to be yours. You are the resident James Bond huge fan. You had a chance to hear the song. What did you think about it? First of all, I have a lot of respect for Billie Eilish. You're I, a bigger fan of her than I, I am. Yeah. I, I, if anybody has any doubts about her and her talent and her brother Phineas's talent, there's a great uh, Rolling Stone video on the making of the song Bad Guy mm -hmm. and how they produced it together and, and created it. Very impressive. They're an impressive duo, and I respect their talent. That said, I have to say that, that maybe this song will grow on me, especially if I see it with Daniel Kleinman's. I'm hoping Daniel Kleinman does the opening uh, credit sequence. He's been doing them since Goldeneye. He skipped Quantum of Solace. He's a genius. But to me, a James Bond song is still coming from an action adventure spy thriller franchise. And I prefer Bond films that are a little bit more brassy and bigger and have a punch to them. Something that, that, that uh, promises what the rest of the movie will deliver. And I felt like along with uh, Sam Smith's song, this film was a uh, this song was a little it was a little sleepy for me mm. and I That's uh, while, fair. while I liked the song I think the song is 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 great it made me like think about being 18 years old and breaking up with a girl than it did about going <laughs> on some multinational spy adventure where I'm taking on the bad guys and and the, the fate of the world is at stake and it, it it's it it I miss the Shirley Bassey, Brassy, Goldfinger, you know, or 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 <laughs> or uh, uh, Paul McCartney doing "Live and Let Die," Sheena Easton "Free Your Eyes Only." I mean, to me, "Free Your Eyes Only." Duran Duran view Duran to a kill. View to a kill, but Sheena Easton's as sleepy as it should get. And while I liked the 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 bo the bo Brosnan, the um, Daniel Craig Bond started out with Chris Cornell's "Another Way to Die," mm. which I mean, uh, uh, I know your name. And then Another Way to Die was Alicia Keys and Jack White for Quantum of Solace, which I love. People don't like that song. I love that song. Then we got Adele doing Skyfall, which harked back to the Shirley Bassey, uh, three Shirley Bassey songs she did. But then we got Sam Smith, really one of my least favorite Bond tunes because it was all like, I'm James Bond and I'm really crying about my lot in life. <laughs> you know, James Bond meets the most beautiful women. He drinks the best champagne, he eats the best caviar, he drives the best cars, he wears the best tailored Tom Ford suits. I mean, he fires the best guns. What is, you, we all want to be James Bond. He's this, styling, profiling, limousine riding, high sky flying, yep, there he's. This song did not make me want to be James Bond. It made me not want to be James Bond because Bond is basically just sad, a sad guy who loses his love, he loses everything all the time. And that's how I feel about it. Aaron, you had a chance to hear the song. What what did you feel? How did you feel about it as a song? And how do you feel about it as a Bond song? I think it is a phenomenal song for meditating. Um, 
for meditating. Yes, I am in complete agreement with Rob on this. Um, I, I listened to the song, the beginning, and here's the thing, I am a Billie Eilish fan. I think, let me put Joey down. Um, I think she's remarkably talented, um, and, I, and I really like what she's doing uh, outside of her music as well. Um, but yeah, the the beginning of it, she has this vocal quiver that she's kind of known for, which I appreciate, but it was very jarring in this setting. Um, it threw me a lot. I was like, okay, how long is this quiver moment gonna last? Cause it's really the whole intro of the song. Um, and yeah, I agree. Like. When I listen to a Bond song, you know, I mean, I, I know a lot of the guys think, oh, the cars and the guns and yes, the women. But when I think of James Bond, I think of the Bond girls. I think about sexiness, sultriness, you know, the, the hourglass curve, you know, crawling out of the ocean and women with names like Octopussy. You know, like I think of these women that are incredibly, almost like the, the first centerfolds from Playboy who were owning their sexuality and making no apologies about it. And when I, like when I hear the, the song Skyfall, it just kind of makes me want to like put on a satin dress with no undies and just sort of <laughs> slink around the room. That's what it makes me feel like doing. <laughs> That's why so we if love anybody's you. got that on Spotify, <laughs> send them away. But you know, this song it didn't it didn't make me feel sexy. It didn't make me imagine that you know that provocative woman with a cigarette just sort of glancing over her shoulder. That's what I want to feel about a Bond movie. I don't go to Bond for the guns and for the cars. I go to Bond for the sex. That's all I want <laughs> in it. Okay. And so if this song is not going to turn me on and make me squirm in my seat a little bit, I'm not really excited to see the movie. You so I'm hoping that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that our first trailers and teasers bring a little bit more sexy. You know, I have to say, you really summed it up because the character of James Bond is, is facing death at, at, at every moment. Mm -hmm. That's why he's a total sensualist. He drinks in life. Yeah. And the last two Bond songs, this Billie Eilish song and Sam Smith's song, were not about that. You know, they were. it was all about, I don't know, lamenting loss and, and thinking about your life and taking stock in who you are and all that. And that Bond doesn't have time for that. Bond is not some <laughs> introspective yeah. emo, let me think about my lot in life you know, and look, and look, I get it. We we already see hey, the the secrets that Leah Sadu has and all that. But really, if Bond's really married to Leah Sadu, he was married to Leah Sadu. He's doing all right. And <laughs> and I think that I, I, what we want from this is we want look the the Bond franchise is all about wish fulfillment. It's all about being the guy you want to be. You know, James Bond is the man every woman wants. He's the man that every other man's scared of, and he's uh, the baddies see him as a threat. That's what these songs should promise. Okay, but but you and I were talking about this a little bit just before the show started. Here's here's my position on this. Most Bond movies, we, we've got a pattern with the opening of the Bond movies. They have their cold open, we have a scene to start the movie, and then we do the opening credit song, right? It really depends. I don't think we can judge this song as a Bond, as a as a Bond theme until we see that opening cold opening. Because if the cold opening is is something that ends with something tragic right and something deep then to go from that into the theme music of ba 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 boom James Bond is here it would feel awkward and out of place and jarring so i'm thinking if this open now this is a big if i'm just speculating here if the cold open ends on something like really either traumatic or tragic happening to bond then that flowing into an opening credit sequence with this song actually works and could work really really well but if it if the cold open is some huge action sequence and it ends with bond standing over his fallen enemy and giving a quippy one-liner then going into i'm so sad then yeah that that will also feel equally jarring i just think it's i think we got to see that cold open first to really know how appropriate the song yeah, is yeah i mean look man specter which is not a great bond movie has an incredible cold open yeah, yeah. on the day of the dead in mexico yeah. city that, it was amazing and then we went into the sam smith song and i'm like what yeah that's I that mean, was that did not work I, I, you and know, the song has to be able to stand alone on its own two feet as yeah. a bond song and still make you feel like skyfall is not a big action you know poppy let's go you know fight some bad guys song it also is very it, it has a a, a slow melody that really sucks you in and could easily follow a tragic scene 
but it still has an orchestral feel to it. You know, you can set Adele in front of a large 32 piece orchestra or yeah. however many pieces an orchestra has. Sorry, guys. Um, but and still have the and still make you feel something. I just didn't feel anything with this. I think it's a a really lovely Billie Eilish song yes. for her album. A great song for her album that I would love to listen to. I just don't think it fits in the world of Bond. All right. Well, go ahead, Rob. Last. No, time. no, no. I, I, you know, I, what I'm curious about is a lot of the time the best Bond songs. The composer also worked with them. Right. So you hear the melody of that song repeated through mm -hmm. the score of the movie, which I always love. And I'll be curious uh, if if that's the case, then I might lo this song. Look, Bond songs can grow on me. And obviously, Billie Eilish is talented. And I did like I liked this as a song. I just don't know if it's a Bond song, but uh, again, like you said, John, let's see it in context. All right, guys, question is for you. What did you think about the song? First of all, what do you think about just as a song, completely independent of anything else? What do you think about the song? Secondly, what do you think about it as a Bond song? Like, I, I thought it felt like a Bond song, but as to its effectiveness, I think what we're saying here is let's see how it fits into the movie before we finally know. But what do you guys think about it? Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, with that down, let's go on to main topic number two. And our second main topic today comes to us from Greg Thompson, who writes, Hey, John, you mentioned that you were going to go head over and watch the Sonic movie. Just wonder if you got around to doing that and what you thought about it. As dumb as it looks, or was it actually okay, like some of the reviewers are saying? All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yes, look, one of the movies this year, much like Call of the Wild, that looks like dumb as rocks is Sonic. This is just a stupid looking movie. And you know, my expectations was it was going to be stupid. However, as I say all the time, you have your pre, you know, your pre-expectations, but then you leave those at the door and then you go into a movie or TV show and judge it on its own merits, right? I thought the Harley Quinn TV show looked stupid. And now I can't get enough of it. Now I completely love it. So I started seeing these pretty decent reviews of Sonic. So I decided to go over last night, me and Soul went over to go watch it last night. And I'll tell you this, this is what I tweeted and then I'll elaborate on it. It's not very good. I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, it's not very good. But that being said, it's also not all that bad. Like certainly nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. Now, let me preface everything by saying these, this thing here. This is important, you gotta get this. This movie is very specifically made for two groups of people, all right? It, number one, is made for children. This movie is clearly made for children. Unlike, say, a Pixar film, which is kid-friendly, it is not made, those movies are not made for children. They're made for everybody, and they put a lot of work into those stories and narratives, and you get great stories, and that's what you get with Pixar. This movie is not that. This movie is very specifically targeted at children. Secondly, this movie is also very much targeted at those who are hardcore Sonic fans. And that can, to some people, can sound like a good thing. To others, it can sound like a bad thing. Like, to me, if you make an MCU movie that only appeals to people who read the comic books, you're not going to have a very popular film franchise. But it will appeal to the people who love the comic books. And I think this is a movie that will absolutely appeal to the people who are hardcore fans of the video game character Sonic. I think it'll appeal to kids. I think it'll appeal to people who are really into it. For the rest of us that are neither children nor really hardcore Sonic fans to start with, it's there's not a lot there, but it's also not bad. Listen, there are moments in this movie that has some legitimately decent laughs. Uh, legit, I can't remember the name of the guy who plays John Raffio. Uh, what's his name? Oh, Schwartz? Ben Schwartz. Ben yeah. Schwartz. Ben Schwartz voicing Sonic. Really good job. I really like the, 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 the manifestation of the character that he brings out with his voice. I really liked it. And I'll say this too. Jim Carrey, this is vintage Jim Carrey. And I mean that in every best possible way. Jim Carrey steals every scene that he's in. I know, Rob, you and I were at CinemaCon last year when they showed us the first little bit of, uh, of Jim Carrey. Yeah. And we were like, okay, how's this going to come across, right? Is this going to seem like Jim Carrey sad, tired, pathetic, desperately trying to recapture some of the former glory. I'm telling you what, this is vintage Jim Carrey. He really, really works. And everybody knows I'm already a pre-existing big fan of James Marsden. I, I, I'm a big James Marsden fan. So 
there are certainly things about, and guess what? It's got some heart to it. This movie has some heart to it. There's actually some moments that you're actually feeling like the, the, the movie emotes. It, it does in places. It really does. So some, some really decent laughs, Jim Carrey's great in it. Um, and some good moments of heart on the negative side. I'll say this. I don't feel like for a general audience, like not hardcore game fans, not children, not enough laughs. I, I felt like they they needed some more big laughs that would have appealed to more people. Um, not enough uh, heart. But there was a lot more to it than I thought there would be. Also, I'm going to say this. The visual effects are terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to say that in a very, very specific way. Because, Rob, I, I think you'll understand, what I, you'll understand what I'm saying here. But I'll, I'll try to explain this. When most people think of visual effects, they just think of the design of the stuff that's in there. The design is fine. The design is fine. Where they really butchered this, I felt, was the compositing. Ooh. Mm. The compositing was terrible. For those of you who don't know what compositing is, it, just think of it like this. Think of it of, of layers, right? So you've got your film layer with the stuff you actually shot on camera. So there's your film layer. Then you got your CGI character and you're putting him on top of that. You're layering it on top of that. And then maybe you're putting a little bit better of a sunset in the background. So you layer that on top of that as well. And so now you've got all these things in here. And you, the, it is the job of the compositor. And I'm way oversimplifying this. I, I This is not scientifically. I'm just saying the compositor is the one who kind of puts all that together, right? The compositing in this movie is so bad. Mm. it's so bad they've got these floating drone things where it totally looks like it does not look like it's actually there oh it's that's... well designed mm. but it's, it just looks like somebody stuck a sticker on the <laughs> film and there are shots and scenes with sonic in it where you can where he's standing against a background and he looks like a stuffed animal in front of a bad green screen mm. because there are some there are some shots of sonic in this movie where he's standing against a background and you can literally visually black lines kind of surrounding his silhouette a, a little bit against it. It's just, oh, it became kind of nerve wracking for me. Do you think that's because as we famously know that that people hated the design of Sonic, so they went back to the drawing board and they re they they redesigned Sonic and they just they didn't have enough time now to go back after that redesign and make sure that the compositing was as they're like, okay, well, we redesigned the character, which was more important, and our target audience is not, it's going to be more forgiving anyway, so it's not like we have to make it look like well, something I, else, like I a would, Jurassic Park. It's a good theory. The reason why I'm not sure, and you could be right, the reason why I'm not sure about it is because like in, in animation, it's not like they had to scrap the movie, go back to the beginning and start from scratch with Sonic. They had all they had all the bones in it. They had the character rigged as it as you were. They had all the animation done. Literally all they had to do was change the model. That's all they had to do. So all the animation information, all that programming was done. All they had to do was change the skin. Sure. And then slap the new skin on it. I mean, I'm, I'm making it sound like it's that's the easiest thing in the world. It's not, but it's one of the easier things as opposed to them having to reanimate it or anything. So maybe maybe even just the new model caused compositing issues. I'm not sure. But then again, you still, the, the drones, no excuse for that. I mean, it was just, by today's standards, it was kind of rough. It was kind of rough. But, yeah. but I, I got to say... I fully expected to hate this movie, and I didn't. It, it I, I didn't hate it. I actually found myself a couple of times grinning and smiling, and there is one scene in particular. I'm not going to give it away, but for those of you who have seen the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. Standing at the elevator. There is a scene where our main characters are standing at an elevator, and there's a bag involved, and that was the best moment of the movie for me and literally got me laughing out loud. I, I was actually laughing out loud at that scene. I thought it was terrific. So some pros, some cons, um, but I think if you have kids, I think your kids are really going to like it. I think if you are a hardcore Sonic fan, and especially for you, stick around for the mid credit scene. If you're a hardcore Sonic fan, stick around for the mid credit scene. I think if, you're, if you fall into one of those two groups of people, I think this is a movie you are really going to like. If you're anybody else... I don't think you have to avoid it. And I, I thought this would be a movie you'd have to avoid. But honestly, I don't think you have to avoid it. If you've got a group of friends going, hey, I think we're going to go see Sonic tonight. I think you can go along. I wouldn't go out of my way to go see it, but I don't think you have to avoid it either. So that's just kind of my thoughts on Sonic. Guys, question is, 
Have you guys had a chance to see Sonic? If so, jump on down to the comment section below and let me know what you thought about the movie. Anyway, with that down, let's move on to main topic number three. And our third main topic today gets sent in to us by Darren, who writes, Even though Jared Leto's Joker was not well received, do you think it would have made more people interested in the film, talking about Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey, if he was in it? After all, no matter who's playing the Joker, it's clear that the character is a big pull for audiences. All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yeah, one of the things we've been talking about the last couple of days is the slight underperformance. Again, I don't think Birds of Prey was ever going to be a $100 million opening. I don't think anybody was expecting that. But even for its modest expectations, it came in a little under expectations, did not perform great. Not horribly, but not great. Question becomes, could having the Joker character in there had increased interest in it. I'm going to go out and say yes. I, I think having the Joker in this movie would have increased interest in the movie for two particular reasons. Number one, just box office data shows us that people get kind of attracted to the Joker, even if it's a Joker that not everybody loves. I like Jared Leto's Joker. Not everybody did, and that's fine. But even then, when you look at certain things like... Jared Leto's Joker's in Suicide Squad, and they featured him pretty well in the advertising. That movie made $746 million. I'm not saying they were because of Jared Leto's Joker, but the fact of the matter is you got Joker in there, $746 million. And of course, the more recent example of that, you put in one that's not even a traditional comic book movie, and you put in a Joker character, it made over a billion dollars. Made over a billion dollars. So that's one reason that I think that, yes, if you had Joker in it, it would have probably done a little bit better at the box office. My second thing is this, is that one of the things that I really enjoyed about Suicide Squad, which is admittedly a hot mess of a movie, but there are, there are things in that movie I really liked. And one of the things that I really dug a lot was this toxic, destructive, awful yet couldn't take my eyes off it dynamic relationship between joker and harley quinn in it when those two were on in a scene together in suicide squad that movie worked every second for me i just loved the dynamic between the two of them i thought that was great and i think when you look at harley quinn when you look at the movie and you see what it was about. I'm not going to spoil any plot details for you guys, but you guys see in the trailers that one of the impetuses of the movie is the fact that she's just broken up with Joker. I think actually having the character in the movie to play off that dynamic just would have made for a stronger movie as well. You know what I mean? Because that's such a central part of the thing about her breaking up with Joker. Having the character there probably would have benefited it. So listen, would have put... Putting the Joker in have made a much better movie? Oh, hey, might have made it worse. Don't know. We'll, we'll never be able to know for sure. But do I think it might have attracted more of an audience to it? Yeah, for those two reasons, I think it actually would have. Would it have suddenly magically made it a $100 million opening weekend movie? No, I'm not suggesting that. But I think it would have made more. Aaron, you did have a chance to go see... Uh, you actually saw it a few hours before I did. You went and saw, I guess what we got to call it now is Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey. Mm -hmm. Do you think if they had thrown the Joker character into it that it might have increased interest in the movie and maybe had a little bit of a bigger opening weekend than it did? Absolutely. I mean, again, we don't know what would have happened with box office. It was a tough weekend with being the Oscars and people wanting yeah. to catch up on 1917 and being R-rated. That I mean, All of those factors automatically. I, I don't know if it's necessarily no Oscar weekend, but the 1917 uh, still pulling in an audience it definitely affects that. I do think that it would have been um, it would have been advantageous for them. And here's the reason why. I agree with you. I want to see more of the Harley and Joker dynamic. And I, like I said yesterday, I think that they tried to make two movies in one. They tried to make a Harley Quinn movie and a Birds of Prey movie and give all of those characters their due when in reality what should have been focused on is the relationship between Harley and Joker seeing how that erodes away to the point where they break up and she's no longer his girl um, and no longer has that protection and then maybe the back and forth of what relationships go through of Harley and Joker breaking up I mean, you know they reference it in the film you know her girlfriends are saying oh well are, is it really going to happen this time are they really going to stay apart I want to see that back and forth dynamic of her 
realizing she can't really have safety and protection without him and being sucked back in. And then what is it that the that is the final straw that just goes, okay, this relationship is never going to happen. Right. Um, and then also, it, it is kind of weird that in a city as small as Gotham, you know, where everybody's bumping into each other all the time and they're all hanging out at the same bars and the same clubs, we never see him, you know? Like, they hang around all the same people. How do we never bump into the ex? Everyone always has that awkward run-in with the ex at the grocery store or whatever. <laughs> how is it that Harley, when she's in this complete, you know, spiral downwards, how is it that she never runs into him? I would have loved to see that. And then a, a slight intro to the Birds of Prey that then becomes that its own separate movie as we really discover who those women are. That's what I would have liked to see. And, and yeah, I think uh, ha have him in there. Would it make it necessarily a better movie, like you said? We'll never know, but it would have been um, it would have been a, a really exciting film for us to see and a better lead in into the Birds of Prey. Rob, you know, when you look at the Joker, some people didn't like Jared Leto's Joker and all that kind of stuff. But do you think at the end of the day, having Joker not necessarily as big of a part as Harley, but just a part of the film, could that have increased interest in the movie? Dude, I think 100 percent what Aaron said is exactly right. I mean, you have these two homicidal maniac characters. What happens when their toxic relationship becomes a city's problem, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the homicidal, <laughs> yeah. the apocalyptic, I love the way you, put you know, that. <clears throat> when, when, <clears throat> and the movie is called the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. Yeah. Why somebody doesn't go, this movie is a metaphor for everyone's toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. It's just these two characters are Batman characters. And when they break up, the world shakes and every, all the, all the people of Gotham run in terror for what is going to happen. The Joker's trying to win Harley back. Harley's trying to escape, but she loves him and she goes back. And yet all of us pay the price. I mean, this could have been, you, you know, you talk about the Me Too movement. There could, this could have been the way Joaquin Phoenix's Joker had so much to say about our society at large. This movie could have looked inward to all of our relationships. We all go crazy based on somebody that we probably shouldn't love but do because they mm -hmm. drive us crazy, but we still are attracted to them anyway. And what if, you know, what if the world pays the price for that toxicity? And that could have been a really interesting movie. And I think that's kind of, there is elements of that in this movie. But without the Joker, like Aaron said, what is she being emancipated from? You know, you don't, you don't, you don't get to see that. And by the way, wouldn't that story have been far more interesting than the rest of the Birds of Prey? All right, listen, I'm going to tell you what right now. Okay, I, I know I've been going on because I thought that Harley Quinn animated show looked like trash. And then I just started watching because everybody told me to watch it. And I did. And now I'm obsessed with it. That show, this stupid little animated show on the DC streaming service does such a better job in a total satire way of looking at Harley Quinn de coming to the conclusion of and then dealing with the ramifications of the breakup of this toxic relationship she was in and does so in a very funny, over-the-top way. But this stupid little animated show does an infinitely better job of that and for really good effect than this live action thing. Now, I get it. I think there was probably an element of this of if we put Joker in, there is a danger of it being perceived as a Joker movie. I I don't know that there's an argument against. I, I think that's a good, I think that's an appropriate fear. Yeah, th there is the danger of that. I just think it would have made for a more interesting movie and I definitely think it would have made for a movie that made more money. And it would have been great for Valentine's weekend opening. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, been, it would have. No, yeah. I didn't even think about it. There's a marketing angle they totally missed out on. Question here is, guys, what do you think? Do you think if they had the Joker character involved to, to a big degree or even a small degree, do you think it would have increased interest in it? Do you think that maybe they could have gotten Jared Leto back even despite all the drama? I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right. With that down, let's move on to our fourth and final main topic today. And our fourth and final main topic today gets submitted to us by Dan, who writes, John. Oh my God, it's finally here. Matt Reeves just dropped the first look of Robert Pattinson as Batman. I know you were one of the first to always be on board with Pattinson uh, taking on the role, so you must be excited. I absolutely love the look and feel of it. What are your thoughts? Thanks. All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, Dan. And yup, 
a mix, all the, the hoopla and everything. We got all excited a couple weeks ago when it was announced that they're actually shooting the movie. The movie is filming now. I mean, so that's, they've been filming for a couple weeks now. That's exciting. Matt Reeves decided to give us our first little look at Robert Pattinson in the Batman outfit. And I, I'm first I'm going to tell you one of my first impressions. As the camera was panning up, maybe not the bat symbol itself, but as you looked at the, the, the Batman outfit, as the camera's panning up, I very distinctly got the Batman Arkham vibe from it. I, I that That's exactly what I thought. Now, I don't know that there's anything about Batman, the Arkham games, that are going to be actually influential in this movie itself. But I thought the design of the outfit was clearly, at least had influence. I thought clearly had influence from the Arkham outfit. And, and yeah, really good. Now, we also saw a little bit more of a narrow kind of looking Batman symbol on the chest. I thought it worked. I thought it worked fine, whatever. But I think what seeing him in the actual cowl did was it gave us a sense of, yeah, he's got the right jawline. Robert Pattinson, <laughs> he's got the right jawline for this. And I think that worked very well. And you know what's funny? I'm still hearing people complaining that you got some twerp, some little some little, yeah, English twerp uh, <laughs> playing him. I disagree. I disagree. This to me, now look, he ain't as big as Henry Cavill. But I look at this and I'm thinking, this is the physique of a guy who is trained by the League of Assassins. Mm. This is the physique of a guy uh, who could wreck a lot of damage on people. And he's certainly in much better shape than, say, Michael Keaton was when he played Batman and nobody had a complaint about that. So I, I have no complaints about the physicality that I think Robert Pattinson is going to be able to bring to this. I, I think he's gotten himself in tremendous shape. Henry Cavill shape? No. But not many people do. So that, that's fine. Besides, Henry Cavill is Superman, so there's that. I got to tell you what. The most important thing I think we need to keep in mind here is that it doesn't. This, this, this whole thing doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just the costume. The costume is not... If this movie is bad, the costume's not going to make it good. And if the movie's good, the costume's not going to make it bad. I mean, remember X-Men 2, which, you know, for some time was firmly in the argument as the greatest comic book movie of all time. It's still, to me, in the top 10 of one of the greatest comic book movies of all time. A lot of people were very upset by the costuming outfits, choices made in the movie. But it didn't stop the movie from being considered one of the great comic book movies of all time. Because it really, ultimately, it doesn't matter. If the costume is great and we hear crappy dialogue and it's a crappy story, that costume ain't going to save it. But since all we got right now is the costume, I'm going to tell you what. I dig it. For, for the limited... Deeply red, saturated look that we got. I will at least say I dig the costume. I, I think it looks pretty good. Rob, you had a chance to take a look at this costume for the first time. What are your thoughts on it? Well, look like you. I liked it. And and really, it, the costume needs to fit the movie. Mm. You know, in, in Tim Burton's Batman, the Anton first production design, the Gotham City that we're presented, is, is someplace from our dreams. You know, it's not a real... American city that we recognize and everything sort of moved from that and then in Christopher Nolan's Batman movie everything they shot a lot in Chicago and the real skylines I mean they were augmented of course with buildings but it looked like a real place that we might be able to visit in our world now if this is inspired by the Arkham game and the Arkham look like you pointed out and I think you're right about that it has a, a different this costume is clearly more stylized um, maybe we're going to get more of a feel that's somewhere in between the two. It's in between Burton's netherworld and Christopher Nolan's more grounded reality, and we're in sort of a combination of the two. And I don't think we'll be able to make a, um, a, a, a real judgment until obviously we, we see more. What I did like about this is it looked unique, and it looked right. unto itself. So we're getting a new vision. We're going to get Matt Reeves' vision, his take, and Pattinson's take on Bruce Wayne, the Batman. And that's exciting to me. I'm, I'm excited that they, they've not been trying to emulate somebody else's vision. It looks like, and again, just judging from what they presented to us, you know, I, I would say that that's what's the most exciting thing to me is that we're getting another unique look at this character and that's what I like. Every time we see Batman, whether it was Ben Affleck, you know, whether it's Michael Keaton, whether it's Christian Bale, we're getting a new, fresh take, and that's hard. 
Yeah. That's hard on a character <laughs> like this. And I think, if nothing else, we should be excited that we're getting a new vision from a world-class filmmaker. And Pattinson's become a world-class actor. Yes, so he has. Color me stoked, dude. Aaron, I'm in. Aaron, you are. I think it's safe to say, out of you know the hardest of hardcore comic book movie fans, you're 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 not. Amongst I'm the, the hardest. Hard oh yeah, but for sure the hardest. But but you had a chance from your perspective, mm -hmm. you had a chance to see this little promotional clip that Matt Reeves decided to leak to everybody and let everybody take a look at. What were your reactions to it? What did you think? I loved it. Really? I loved it. I I mean I I saw immediately you know all the a lot of the feelings that I wanted to feel from the age the, from the James Bond song. I felt some of those feelings with Batman. I felt like it was the it, it was really sexy. It was really dark. You know, Tom wasn't so impressed with it and I said, you know, this makes me feel like this movie is going to be really really dark, like sinister um in 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 some really exciting and juicy ways. Uh and with and with how dark we saw Joker and even though this is not necessarily the same, you know, I know this is more DC universe and Joker was not, but I really feel like the uh the bar has been moved for how dark we're allowed to go and making as Rob said earlier, you know, social commentary. Can, and also, speaking of social commentary, it's interesting to me that I did read some of the backlash of how he's not big enough, he's not buff enough, and it's really fascinating to me that you know we we just saw this picture of Robert Pattinson. He looks great. He's got you know his abs are popping out, his deltoids are defined. He's clearly been working out and getting his body prepared. But the way that things have shifted from say like the 80s and the 90s with women and with men i mean julia roberts you know said in an interview that if she had started acting you know 20 years later she would never have been able to be successful because she was never skinny enough or small enough or toned enough she never had a six pack um and so i think that the same level of expectation that has been put on women is also being put on men. You're either, you know, big Chris Pratt or you're fit Chris Pratt. There's like nowhere in between. And one of the things that I think people love about Batman is the fact that he's not he's not a superhero. He's a really attainable guy. He's just somebody that went through something horribly tragic in his life and made a, and he had a lot of money so he bought a bunch of toys and that's the thing that allows him to be a vigilante superhero it's not the fact that he was chemically altered in some way or he was from another planet he's just a normal guy and that's what i like about the fact that robert pattinson is slighter of build because it makes him more um aspirational for the every man who's watching at home going, man, I wish I could do some vigilante justice as well. Well, if you're a bajillionaire and you buy the toys, you can. Robert Pattinson is the proof. I Now listen, I'll, I'll admit something here. If I had all other things being equal, I, I would like a full bodybuilder kind of Bruce Wayne. Yeah, if I, if I all other things being equal, if I could just pick all my my fantasy things out of things, would I like Batman? That's just like kind of the peak of of what a human genetics can actually do. Sure, but I also I prefer you getting a really good actor to play the role, and then you must at least get that actor in really good shape. And and once again, I mean, I I just look at this. I look at a big guy. I mean, look at the shoulders on this dude. And like yeah. it's it's deceptively how big his arms are in this. Mm -hmm. I, I look, is this a bodybuilder? No. But number one, you got to get a great actor. They clearly went out and got a great actor. And then number two, make sure that actor is in as good physical shape as he can possibly be. And I think they've done that. So, yeah, I would like a big bodybuilding uh, Batman, sure. But I'm totally happy with. But this. look but, at the actor who plays Homelander on The Boys. I mean. Tom, oh, sure. Tom auditioned for that role, and I was like, "Clearly, you're this guy. He's six foot three. He's like, I mean, yeah." Tom for those is, of you who don't know, Tom, Tom, Tom's a big lad. Tom's yeah. a big lad. <laughs> Tom, yeah, he, he's he's looking he's looking a little Thor these days. Actually, uh, he's, we've been on the whole thirty, so he's he's looking pretty good. But that being said, <laughs> I assumed when I watched the boys that the that the guy who played Homelander, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name right now, but I assumed that he was a big dude, and then I saw them in interviews. And he Five foot four. Yeah, he's a, he's a he's tiny. a he's a small guy. And um, but the so the camera can do anything. And as far as the uh, costume may or may not make or break the show, let's all remember that debacle with Wonder Woman the TV series and that leaked image of Adrian um, uh, Padalecki. Pa 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 uh, in the Hollywood Boulevard. 
version of Wonder Woman costumes, and it, it it pretty much put a nail in the coffin before that show even came out. And then the show well, the but, show wasn't the good, show was though. terrible <laughs> along <laughs> with it. But like we we got a really good idea of how bad things were going to be just from this costume. And if this is the direction that the new Batman is going, the Batman, I'm pretty excited. But you know the picture you also showed of of Robert Pattinson. A lot of the way that we look at actors today when they, they go on these regiments to turn them into like Gerard Butler in 300. Right. You know, people don't look like that. And, and right. Robert Pattinson, I buy it, as I like to say. There's verisimilitude there because Batman can't look like a guy who has absolutely no body fat who's a swimmer or a, or a cyclist like the Tour de France. He has to look like somebody who also can move fast mm -hmm. but yet has enough power behind a punch that he really can take dudes out and lay them out. And Pattinson with those arms and, and the trapezius muscles, he looks like a guy that I do not want to run up against in a dark alley because he would kick my ass. <laughs> and you got to believe that. And you got to believe also that he can move. Yeah, yeah, and, and he and also doesn't you, have all the time. You know, guys that look like that, they don't have a lot else to do during the day. They have very regimented. Like I know people who look like that, and their entire life is dedicated to it. They are in the gym for hours every single day. They're what they're eating is they're weighing all of their food. I mean, it's a lifestyle, and it's just not realistic for Batman. He's got way more important things to do than weigh his chicken breast. <laughs> anyway, guys. <laughs> so I was curious about what you guys thought about uh, the the this first images we've got of Robert Pattinson's Batman. So I decided to make that the topic of today's question of the day and let's go over and take a look at that right now so i put this up just before the show started and i simply asked you guys this question on twitter i asked what do you think of the look of the robert pattinson's batman that matt reeves released and so i gave you guys three options right now actually color me surprised only 6.8 percent of you guys say you didn't like it I, I mean, just look, we're fans are a finicky group, so I, I just assume that would at least be 20 or 30 percent. But right now, out of, we got almost 3,400 of you guys have voted already. Only less than 7 percent of you guys are saying it's awful. 57.4 percent of you guys are saying it's great. And 35.8 are saying it's OK. It's, it's a Batman outfit. So overwhelmingly, you guys seem to accept or like it. And a lot less of you didn't like it than I thought you would. So that's interesting to me. So, guys, question is, what do you think? about this first look we got at the new Robert Pattinson Batman. Jump on down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With all that down and out of the way, we're going to head into our live questions just a minute. If you want to submit a live question, there's two ways to do it. First of all, the best way is to use the link that's in the top of the description of this video. It's just streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. Go ahead and use that. Send in your question. is the best way to do it. Or you can just use the Super Chat feature here on YouTube. But before we get to the live questions, we are going to take, as we do every day, a short little break here, rest the vocal cords, stretch the legs, refill the drinks, give you a chance to run and use the bathroom yourself. So hang tight, guys. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back with your live questions. We'll see you in just a couple minutes.
guys, and we are back. Thank you so much for your patience and indulgence as we took a little bit of a break there. Now let's jump over and start taking your guys' live questions. We're going to start off uh, with Willow, who I got to get the rest of her question on here. Hold on a second. Uh, Willow writes, um, as idiotic as best popular film is, I can understand why it was proposed. Most movies nominated in the major award categories aren't high grossing films. I don't know if people are interested in an award show about films they've never seen. Well, my, my response to that would be this. There have been many, many years in Oscar history when there was uh, awards being nominated for, for movies that a lot of people hadn't seen, and they did great. I think that's the thing. The Academy Awards, the show is not the important thing. I think that's what the Academy Awards got to keep in mind. The show is not the important thing. The Academy is a year-round organization, blah, blah, and then they present their best. And I really, that's the thing. The more they start giving into, we got to do things that are totally contrary to what we even exist for, just to do things to bring in viewers for the broadcast of the show that we do once a year, that is ass backwards thinking that they need to resist and stay away from. So, uh, I mean, I agree with you, Will. I could see the temptation. I could understand the temptation of that, mm. but it's such an idiotic, such an idiotic thing for them to have, to have yeah, I'm so glad they scrapped it. I'm Cooler heads prevailed, they scrapped it, and that's the important thing. All right, Daniel Rahim, Rahimi writes, it took me only a decade watching your show, but I'm finally asking you a question. Well, thank you, Daniel. We appreciate that, man. Thanks for watching for so long. Uh, I loved Birds of Prey, and I get that you didn't. But are you seriously telling me you thought Suicide Squad, Batman versus Superman, and Justice League are better than Birds of Prey? Yes, in every single way. Mm. Yeah, I do. Now, let's, uh, like, let's take the worst case scenario there. Let's take uh, let's take Suicide Squad, which I think not everybody would. Most people would probably would probably say that's the worst out of the three films you just mentioned. The things that are bad about Suicide Squad are worse than the things that are bad about Birds of Prey. But the things that I enjoyed about Suicide Squad were better than the things I enjoyed about Birds of Prey as well. And overall, so at the end of the day, I actually kind of, I, I at the end of the day, Suicide Squad, I walked going out, I liked it. Didn't love it. It's a hot mess of a movie, but I liked it. And I think it was because of those specific reasons. Rob, um, would I mean I don't want you to give too much away because we're about to record a podcast for best movie worst movie, but um, what, what would you say? Yeah, out of those films, which one would you say is the least good? Mm -hmm. I have to say that Justice League was the movie that disappointed me the most, but it was watchable because I like the actors playing those characters. I loved seeing the Justice League on the big screen. Mm. It just ultimately I thought was a, a real letdown, especially. After seeing, we saw those trailers, and you could see, obviously, Zack Snyder. I am not somebody who's running around saying, release the Snyder Cut, but I think it was a huge mistake. I understand he had a family tragedy, but I think one of the biggest mistakes, one of the most ridiculously reactionary things they ever did was not go with Zack Snyder's film. And I think that was, a, Walter Hamada had not come in then. There was a lot of turmoil and tumult over there at the DCEU, or, or whatever you want to call it, the DC Universe, you had Suicide Squad, you had people recutting Batman v Superman. There was just this, the, the executives had lost faith, and they were trying to scramble around doing I don't know what, so there was a lot of weirdness happening, and I think Justice League is the greatest casualty of that studio indecision. At least Birds of Fr Prey uh, was more of, and I've heard there was reshoots even on that movie, but at least but it every felt, comic book movie has reshoots. Yeah, it felt more cohesive. Justice League was just to me a a mess. I like Justice League. <laughs> I actually saw it like seven times in the theaters. Aaron, uh, I don't know. Would would you say you like Birds of Prey more than other any of the other DC films that you've had a chance to see? Yeah, I mean, I, I I here's the thing. I don't think that it was a bad movie. No, you know, and here and, and also had the movie done better at the box office, we would all be going, oh, my God, it's actually not that bad. You know, like, oh, uh, no, I still would have said well, it's not good. Maybe. But I think the vast majority of people look at box office results to validate, you know, their own opinion about a film. Now, if the film goes on and does incredible numbers worldwide, then maybe some people will be eating crow. I don't know. But there I, I talked to a lot of people who said, I love this movie. I I, it was everything that I wanted it to be. You know, there are a lot of mixed reviews about Birds of Prey, so I think lumping it in with the worst of the worst of DCEU is just not fair. 
Uh, it's the worst. Anyway, uh, but by the it's way, the Justice worst. League. The problem with Justice League wasn't that they removed Zack Snyder. It's that they let him direct it in the first place because it was and I'm a Zack Snyder fan, but it became clear that despite how great Man of Steel was, did not resonate with the audience, despite the fact that, um, you know, you had Batman versus Superman, which clearly was hyper divisive. They shouldn't have let him do done the third film. He clearly showed that his vision of the of the DCU was not resonating with enough people and they just shouldn't have gotten now. Once you let them go ahead and start it, they probably should have let them go ahead and finish it. But I still like the final product. That's just me. All right, let's move on here. Next one up is uh, Dumbledore Calrissian who writes, top five Jim Carrey movies. Number five, Bruce Almighty. Number four, Yes Man. That's underrated. I think Yes Man's a little bit underrated. Number three, Liar Liar. Number two, The Truman Show. Number one, Dumb and Dumber. I know you don't do rankings, but uh, do you have some favorites of his? We, I don't know that you can do any top five of Jim Carrey and not put uh, uh, Spotless Mind. Yeah, I was um, going to say the Eternal Sunshine, oh, yeah. Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. That's my and, favorite Jim Carrey movie. Uh, and the the um, the original Ace Ventura Pet Detective, Mask. Oh God, I love Mask. What was the one that he did about the um, the comedian? Oh, oh about uh, Andy Kaufman. Man the Andy Man Kaufman. The Man on the Moon. Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought I he was mean, brilliant in that as well. Yep. I mean, when you really stop and think about it, Jim Carrey has had a hell of a career, like a really hell of a career. Um, okay, let's move on here. Uh, anonymous viewer writes, I think the perception that the Oscars are elitist began after the Dark Knight snub. Uh, before that, we had winners like Forrest Gump, Titanic, Gladiator, Lord of the Rings, etc. Both great movies and box office mega hits. No recent winner can claim that. I think, yeah, look, that's the thing. A, a lot of people go back just to the Dark Knight thing, which, by the way, the Dark Knight was in the year that was the final year that they only limited the number of nominees to five. So, I mean, there was that. But I mean, a lot of big, high-profile films have been nominated for big, major awards. Every, they just haven't won, but it's not the job of the Academy. It's not a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. It's what do these film professionals feel is the best film of the year? And look, for even this year, one of the most major awards at the Academy Awards, Best Lead Actor, went to a comic book film, made, went to a film that made over a billion dollars. So, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Whenever I hear people talk about how you know, the Oscars, they don't like popular films. I'm like, well, that's fine for you to say that if you just want to ignore all the data because mm -hmm. the data suggests otherwise. But that's just kind of my thought on that. All right, 50 Shades of Geek writes, Aladdin was my third favorite movie of the year last year. I'm super happy it's getting a sequel. Now, did you get a chance, Aaron, last night? I know you thought you might get a chance to sit down last night and watch that, you and Tom. Did you watch that last night? Oh, oh did you not hear what I said before we started the show? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. So Tom and I sat down to watch Aladdin. Um, he was getting us um, something, a little snack. And I said, let me just go check the mail. And so I ran out to check the mail and found a letter from the IRS letting us know that we're being audited for 2016, which was the year we were both diagnosed. So I said, I'm going to smoke a copious amount of marijuana and go right to bed. So no, I did not see Aladdin last night. Got it. But it, uh, <laughs> I, I do. I agree. I completely love that movie. I think it's great. All right. Finish Shades also writes, I think Rick Moranis coming back to do Shrunk means the movie is going to be very special, or maybe I'm just being hopeful, I guess. Well, listen, I, I think there's something to that, because like, Rick Moranis has stayed out of movies for over 20 years. For it to have a movie come out, to get him to come out of retirement and to do it, I think it's more than just, oh, because it's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I think it goes beyond that. I think there's got to be something there that says that this script has to have something to it that he thought, yeah, I want to be involved with this. Rob, what do you think? I, I think you're right. I mean, it, it's first of all, it's probably near and dear to his heart because the first, the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is such a, what a wonderful movie. I mean, I, I love that film so much. I love the visual effects in it. I loved him in it. Uh, it's a family movie, but it's still, it works for everyone. And I think that... Uh, they had to have enticed him with good material. So I'm excited. I, I really like the franchise. I really like Rick Moranis, and he's been gone way too long. Aaron, what do you think? Very excited about this. And and I think it might also bring back some really beautiful memories of his time with his wife before he did take his hiatus from the industry. Um, you know, she was alive when he was filming those projects, obviously. And this might be a really nice thing for him to revisit and something for his children to be able to be involved in as adults now that they're grown. All right. Next up, uh, Superman Steve writes, John, I saw the first look at Robert Pattinson's new bat suit. Uh, yes, you did. Um, 
new bat suit. I have to say, I personally don't like it one bit. I really hope in the movie it looks way better, but definitely not a fan of the first look of the suit. What did you think about? It? Well, we made that one of our. T- I thought it looked really good. I, I thought again, very reminiscent to me of the Arkham outfit. Uh, I think the cowl looks really good on him. Again, it's very heavily deep red saturated. The camera's really tight on it. It's a, it's difficult for us to have a real opinion of it quite yet, but uh, from the little that we saw, I got to tell you, Superman, Steve, I I was actually pretty good with it. I kind of like it. But again, ultimately, that means, doesn't mean the movie's going to be any good, but I thought the costume looked pretty good. I'm really curious what Steve, Superman Steve didn't like about it. I mean, well, a lot of like he he's not, he doesn't say what he didn't like about it. He just says I don't like it, and I hope that the movie is better. But I'm like, well, but well, it's, it's hard. But some like aesthetic. It's sometimes it's hard to put your finger on something. Like somebody you just look at something and you say that it's visually pleasing to me. Maybe you can't define right away what it is that's pleasing. Right, to but you, but we can, but we've all talked about why we find the bat suit aesthetically pleasing. I haven't heard one person yet explain why they find it yeah, aesthetically unpleasing. But you so, don't have to. You don't have to explain it. I know. I'm just saying I'm curious. I I am curious, too. Because, I mean, I I have a feeling this. I have a feeling, you know, we referenced the very thin Batman kind of logo. I think that might not sit well with a lot of people. Mm. Because a lot of times you get a very chunky Batman logo on there. So I don't don't know. Maybe that might rub some people the wrong way. Like, I I understood when people said the Batsuit is not supposed to have nipples. That I get. Yes. That's very, very clear. But, you know, I, I am actually, I'm genuinely curious. You know, a lot of people seem to not be thrilled with it. I'm just curious, like, if you can put your finger on it, people, what actually. is it? Not many people, actually. Not many people. Surprisingly, not many people, which is uh, really weird to me. Plus, it's, you, you you don't get a sense of what it looks like with the cape billowing. You, you've you seen now, basically a waist-up shot. You, you barely get any detail. I, I think... You, you. This is not the kind of shot that's meant to be judged. You know, it's not like it's a, it's a Vogue or a GQ magazine shoot where we're getting full body shots with beautiful lighting. Yeah. I mean, this is a very stylized glimpse to tease mm-hmm. you. So to have a judgment about whether you like this suit or not, I'm not saying you can't have that, but I think that you got to, you got to leave your leave your mind a little bit more open. I, but that's what I'm saying is if you're gonna poo poo something based on this much of it. You know, what are you backing that up with? Like, why? Well, That's all I want to know. I, I just I just think sometimes you look at something you can't really put your finger on. Why. I want to answer, damn it. <laughs> like, for instance, I, the Billie Eilish tune. I liked it. If you tell me why did I like it, I can't. I don't know that I could tell you why. I just know that I heard it. You already it and, told and it us why. No, I, not really. I mean, I just I just <laughs> thought it was pleasing. I just thought it worked. But again, well, we're going to have to see how it fits in the movie. Anthony Garola writes, Hey, John, love the show. Thank you so much, Anthony. Watch it every day. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the new Robert Pattinson Batman costume. <laughs> Is there anything different you're hoping from this new Matt Reeves Batman? Um, I, again, I, I like it. I, I think it works. It's a Batman costume, so, so I'm good with it. Is there anything I'm different I'm hoping for in this Matt Reeves Batman? I would like a little bit more. Again, look, I, I want to see whatever movie Matt Reeves is going to give us. I, whatever he's going for, I just want to see if he does it well. That's all I care about. If I had my pick, though, it would be interesting to see a little bit more of the detective side of Batman. I mean, look, mm. Rachel Ghoul even just, he doesn't even call him Batman. He just calls him detective. I mean, he is to be the world's greatest detective. I would like to see a little little bit more of that rob if you had a, if you had your druthers matt reeves called you up and say hey rob i'm feeling generous today just tell me one little aspect about batman you'd like me to put a little more emphasis on what would it be i think that you know i want to see more if believe it or not more of bruce wayne's debonair lifestyle ingratiating mm. himself all through gotham using his position to get into places that he needs to find out information i like the subterfuge and i like you know the undercover whenever bruce wayne's out in public he's basically undercover because unlike Superman, you know, Batman is like what he became, and Bruce Wayne is the mask that he's put on. It's sort of reversed, and I like seeing Bruce Wayne out into the world and doing things, and I would like to see more of the dichotomy of the character, and I want to see more, like you said, sleuthing around and getting involved with people rather than just, you know, getting to the next action scene with the cowl. Mm -hmm. All right, next up here, we've got Major Tom who writes, Hey, John, big fan. Thank you so much, Major Tom. What are some fairly obscure movies that you think people should see? For me, I recently saw Jennifer Kent's The Nightingale. Absolutely brutal, but very good. And Dragged Across Concrete. Dragged Across Concrete was really good. One I often go back to is a little horror comedy called Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. (laughs) It is 
a absolutely wonderful, wonderful film. It's a movie that, first of all, kind of starts as a comedy. Like, and it's it, it deconstructs the horror genre through the eyes. It imagines a world where all the supernatural serial killers are all real. It imagines, the, it's a fake documentary in a world where Freddy was real, Mike Myers, uh, Jason, that all of them were real. And this documentary crew starts following this up and coming new s- supernatural serial killer uh, by the name of Leslie Vernon. And it follows him as he's going through his training to prepare for being this super, he's stalking out who <laughs> his victims are gonna be. Uh, and then, it, but it really becomes interesting a, a real deconstruction of what the horror genre is and why people love horror. And then in the third act, actually a little bit into the third act, the movie changes gears very suddenly and goes from fake documentary to horror movie in in the last little bit. And it's really good on both ends. It's hilarious. It's it's wonderful. It's insightful. It's smart. Um, Some of the cameos in it are wonderful. It is a delightful little film that I've always wished it got the attention it deserves so they could have done a sequel. But the one I go to is uh, the rise behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon. Rob, if you had one obscure kind of film that maybe didn't get the love it deserved, which one would you point out? It's a science fiction film that came out in 2009 that stars Jared Leto called Mr. Nobody. Uh-huh. And it is, there's two different yeah. versions. Watch the director's cut. I'm a huge fan of this film. Hardly anybody I talk to ever ever knows about it or hears about it. I just think it's a wonderful movie about the road less traveled and what it means to get old and look back on your life and the choices that you make in a science fiction context. And I love the film. Aaron, do you got one that uh, that you go to when people say, what's a, like a smaller film that maybe doesn't get enough attention that you love? You know what? There was a movie uh, a movie called Rays that Zoe Bell actually produced and starred in. Um, and it's a really cool film about these women that have been essentially captured and forced to fight to the death um, at, almost in a gladiatorial type of, uh, type of space for the enjoyment of the privileged elite. And the things that are on the line for them in each of their rooms they have a screen and there's a camera that is pointed at like the person they love the most their child their dying mother something like that so every day they are have they have a reminder that the people who have captured them have the person that they love and the only way to get back to them is to fight to the death with another woman who has the exact same thing to lose and i think it's a really interesting uh example of the different way that uh, women can uh, can be shown in brutal fight scenes, but also for a very different for different reasons than oftentimes men are portrayed, and uh, and and having an addition a different emotional tone. It's a really interesting exploration of that. And Zoe does a phenomenal job. By the way, did you hear Brad Pitt uh, shout out Zoe when when he received the the BAFTA? Absolutely, and as he should. Yes, yeah, that was great. Yeah, hey. and Tracy Toms is also in Rays as well. Great movie to check. But yeah, Zoe and Zoe and Brad were t- uh, she she told me about th- that they had a really good time together. All right, well, guys, listen, it is past 1030, so we're going to let Erin go because she's got things she needs to do today. Rob and I are doing podcasts later today, so he's sticking around today. But, Erin, where can people all oh, look at little Joe? Like where, a little Ewok. Where can people find you and the adventures of Joey Bishop? Oh, you can find me at Erin L. Cummings on Twitter and Instagram. And you can find Joey and Joey's siblings at Rat Pack Cats, which I know I need to update more photos, but uh, we'll do that. All right. Thanks for being here, Aaron. We will talk to you next week. All right. Let's keep on going now. We got a bunch more questions to get through, guys. We're going to try flying through these pretty quick. Uh, Obviously, a lot of stuff came in today. All right. Nerd Aaron writes, in our world, busting out of federal, in our world, busting out of federal prison would be a big deal. In their world, Arkham is still allowed to operate. So they have to grade on a curve. This is why the Gotham police are apathetic, not pathetic, apathetic. Um... I don't, I don't know. There's still a sense of believability that you have to... I think you have to maintain a certain sense of believability. Like, again, I'm cool with, like, your, the mov- your movie's logic being different from the real-world logic. I just want, once you establish what your movie world logic is, be consistent with your movie world logic. That's all I ask. And I found that to be a really... A, one of the big problems with, uh, with Birds of Prey, for me at any rate. All right, uh, let's move on here. Next up is Savannah P- 
Pavanthan, who writes, uh, if Sam Raimi is directing Doc's, uh, Doctor Strange 2, over under 35% that Bruce Campbell will make a cameo appearance uh, just like Matt Damon is, is in Thor, Matt Damon is in Thor Ragnarok. Rob, I don't see how Bruce Campbell doesn't make a cameo appearance in this a- a- at all. So 35%? Dude, I feel very comfortable taking over 35% on that. Do you think he'll he'll bring in Bruce Campbell to do at least a cameo? Dude, it's 100%. <laughs> I mean, there there's no Of course you, you of course he's going to make a cameo in that movie. Of course he is. Why would you think not? All right. Uh let's move on here. Next up comes to us from where are we at here? We're at the nerd Aaron who writes, uh, "Do you know people who dismiss Avengers 4 as a cash in?" Knowing narrow-minded people uh, personally is one of the reasons why many of us don't trust the Academy when it allows such members. I say this uh, does hurt the ratings. No, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. And by the way, you're also wrong to say anybody who thinks... Look, if you don't think that a part of the reason Avengers Endgame was made was as a cash-in, then that's a special kind of naivete. That, Of course, that is a big reason that is one of the big reasons. One of the big reasons that the MCU exists at all is as a cash-in. One of the main reasons any movie you love ever got made was because there was a producer behind it thinks we can make some money here. That is absolutely a big part of it. It is absolutely. You, you just This isn't a matter of opinion. This isn't a subjective thing. There is an element of Endgame. There's an element of Star Wars. There's an element of all these things that we love that is absolutely a cash-in. And it is not narrow-minded to think otherwise. We can disagree to, to what degree it is and all that kind of stuff. But every se- all 7,000 members of the Academy are human beings. And there are many human beings that look at certain films certain ways and others that don't. But therein lies, Rob, I bring this up all the time, therein lies the, the brilliance of the Academy system. If you have a system like the Golden Globes that has just 60 members of the foreign press, then if you've got 10 people in that out of those 60 who have kind of a warped view on something, that is a massive percentage and how that could skew the outcome of what the Golden Globes are. The Academy is over 7,000 professional cinematographers, writers, directors, actors, producers, studio people, journalists, blah, 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 but over 7,000 of them. So even if you get 100 of them, that have some weird twisted view of something that represents a tiny percentage of the overall voting body and the sheer size of the voting body uh, inoculates itself. It's a self inoculation. It inoculates itself from those kind of fringy weird things that'll have. And again, you get movie audiences have people like that. People in any voting body will have that. It's just a part of life. That's the real thing. And it is, I don't know, Rob, how would you respond to that? Well, I, I totally agree with what you said. Also, I think a lot of the film fans that we know, John, are actually, um, as much as I love my constituency and I love science fiction, fantasy, and horror movies, I'm surprised at how many fans, how limited their understanding or knowledge of film really is. There's so much film history. There's films from all over the world. There's incredible directors. I mean, when I meet somebody who loves the MCU but hasn't seen a Kurosawa movie like Seven Samurai or hasn't seen a John Ford movie like The Great Escape, you know, or hasn't seen Lawrence of Arabia, I'm always like, really? You know, do you, do you only watch MCU fan or movies and DCEU? Because the world is full of such great cinema, and there's such a rich history of cinema that that you know maybe Academy Award members don't know about the Avengers, but I'll bet they know about a lot of other movies. You know, so it really is depending on where you're coming from, and that's the great thing about being a movie fan. There's so much. There's so much to delve into. You can never run out of great movies to watch. And you know, you know what I find too. And this, uh, listen, I, I know a lot of people are going to be happy that I'm going to say this, but I, I don't care. I, I'm, I'm here to speak. I'm here to speak truth. Here's the thing. I find a lot of the people too that will often, and I'm not saying nerd errant that you're doing this. I, I'm just saying this is a, a, a broader, yeah, a broader thing. That's what I was speaking at. Too. A lot of going back to what somebody said earlier, and Robin piggybacking off what you just said. You know, there are a lot of people who will say like, oh, uh, the, the Oscars are elitist because uh, da, 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 da. I often find the people saying that are in and of themselves massively elitist because they didn't watch Moonlight. They right. didn't watch If Beale Street Could Talk. They didn't watch, you know, uh, Parasite. And like a lot of the times when I hear the people who talk about, oh, the Oscars are elite because they didn't, they didn't appreciate these films. I'm like, did you even watch any of the, did you watch any of these films? No. Well, then who's the elitist? 
It's just a different type of elitism. Right. And I find that all of us have this kind of these weird idiosyncrasies in Tennessee. Well, but what, anyway. What's so crazy is a guy like Bong Joon Ho is a world class filmmaker. Yeah. He's made science he's made a science fiction movie. He's the made host. a monster movie. He's made a, a a serial killer movie. You know, the guy has he's got the kind of output that anybody who's watching this show right now would love his movies. And yet, have our audience have they seen these movies? And it's funny, I'm like, well, He's somebody you should be loving the same way you love Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I've said this before, but for, for for the first number of years I was doing this job, going right up until the uh, the first few years of doing AMC, and I was doing AMC uh, movie news there, I felt like a part of my job was trying to get movie fans to open up their minds and watch comic book movies. It's like, guys, you really should try out comic book movies. You really should. And then about halfway through to near the end of my time at AMC, I felt like my job kind of switched to, I got to see if I can convince people who are into comic book movies to try other kind of movies. Right. Like, I know, hey, guys, listen, freaking Shazam is awesome. Man of Steel is awesome. Endgame is awesome. Have you seen Moonlight? You should may maybe go out and try Moonlight because I think you're really going to love it. It's a great motion picture. So it's just kind of weird how the, the times have changed. Kind of like, you, Rob, you will often talk about how you know, there was an era that you couldn't get a really decent director on board for a comic book movie. It was difficult to get a big name movie star to get plugged into a comic book movie. But now the page is completely flipped. Yes. Now the big name stars, and the big name directors, for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part are lining up to be in these comic book properties. And I, I feel like it's that's kind of reflected in the audience as well. I agree. I agree. Uh, but there's a lot of film to enjoy, guys. There's a lot of film to enjoy. All right. Uh, JC uh, Quinwans writes... Uh, sends in a $50 one. Thank you so much for that, JC, supporting the channel. If there's a question in here, not only will we answer right now, but in the next week or two, we will answer it in its own standalone video as well. So thank you for supporting the channel on that level, dude. All right, let's get to it. Hey, John, you are awesome. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. Please tell that to my wife. Uh, I'm curious to know, what is your preferred cinema experience? Oh, this is easy. Uh, Dolby Cinema, IMAX Laser, Regal RPX, Cinemark XD, 4DX, 3D, Digital. I really love Dolby Cinema. Have a great day. You are awesome. This is an easy one for me. Listen, uh, not to diminish any of the those formats and, and viewing experiences that you just listed at all, but for me, that is easy. It is Dolby Cinema Prime. Uh, AMC's Dolby Cinemas, with with their combined with their Prime stuff, is my favorite movie going experience. And for example, last night, Rob, me and Soul, uh, we're we're gonna go watch uh, Sonic, and there was no way we could make a 5 p.m. screening. There was a 5 p.m. screening in the Dolby Prime, and there was no way we were gonna make it. Now there was a 6:40 in a regular theater. It all in the same location. And we actually contemplated missing the first half hour of the movie just so we could go and watch it in the Dolby Prime. I mean, that's how much I really, really do like that viewing experience. So for me, it's the Dolby Prime. Rob, there's a lot of great cinematic formats there, pr uh, premium cinematic formats for us to go and watch. Do you have a preferred one you like to do? Well, look, I love IMAX Laser. But again, it's it's you have to have a place that presents it correctly. We have the Universal City Walk that does a great job with IMAX, and then the Chinese Theater, which was an old theater that was converted into an IMAX screen. I love that. But I have to say, John, like you said, uh, getting a Dolby, the one thing that what a Dolby Cinema says is it's been calibrated correctly. Dolby Labs has made sure you have the best picture and the best sound. And that's what fascinates me. That's what I want the best. The last time I went to a Dolby Cinema was with you to see Joker. And the presentation's fantastic. And that's what you want. You want the best picture and the best sound. And that is it. And Dolby Cinema always delivers. All right. Next up here, we got... Uh Arcast6, who writes, Hey, John, now that we know what your doc is about, uh, can't wait to watch it. Thank you so much for that, dude. I appreciate that. I was wondering if you will look at the music used in trailers. For me, a good trailer music gets uh, song gets me pumped for the movie. Oh, that's absolutely... Like, I'm not going to say how much of it we actually cover, but that is absolutely something that has already been brought up uh, in some of the interviews that we've done for the documentary. So, yes, that will be addressed. It will absolutely be addressed. And thank you so much for mentioning it, man. I appreciate that. All right, Rob Tastic writes, Thank you so much, John, for the heads up on watching Matt Shat. I haven't laughed that hard in a while. Keep it filthy, bro. I'm so glad you watched it. Rob, have you seen the Margot Robbie Saturday Night Live sketch, Matt Shat? No. 
when we are done this show today before Cliff comes over for us to do our podcast, I have got to show you. It is one, I mean, I, it's not quite as big, as it's not quite as good as the Ryan Gosling alien abduction uh, sketches, which is one of the funniest things they've done in the last 20 years, but it's up there. This Matt Schatz sketch is so good. Huh. I'm so glad, Rob Tastic, that you had a chance to check it out. So if any of you guys have not seen, just go look up Margot Robbie, Matt Schatz, and watch that, that sketch and thank me later. Uh, it is great. All right, next up, Mr. TJ Lynn writes, uh, Mrs. Maisel doesn't look... Jeez, guys, please watch your typing. It's hard to read. Mrs. Maisel doesn't look all good, but I went to check it out, and oh my God, it's marvelous. I binged all three seasons. It's now my favorite show of all time. My favorite character is Susie. The manager is so fine. She is great. And Miriam Maisel herself. Not a big fan of Tony Shalhoub's character. Oh, I love Tony Shalhoub's character. I love... Listen, to your point, TJ, I... My, I had no interest in watching the show when it first came out, like none. And it was when we were on vacation Anne was like relaxing one day. She goes, she goes, I already watched the first episode, but you have to sit down and watch it again with me. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. You know, you know, humor the wife, you know, sort of thing. And we binged the whole first season in just a couple of days while on vacation, while on vacation, we binged it. It is mar I mean no pun intended. It's marvelous. It's fantastic. And there's a reason why it's winning it's won so many awards. Rob, I know you're a big fan of uh Mrs. Mason. What, what what is it they really got you hooked into it? Well, you know, first of all, I, when I first started, I didn't realize it's a period piece. You know, it it, it evokes a, a a past that I don't think exists, but the cast is so good. The production values are so good. The performances are so good. The two main characters, Mrs. Maisel and, and her manager, Susie, those characters are so much fun to watch. All the secondary characters, the great comedian Lenny Bruce, and if you don't know who he was, he's a real he was a real guy. Uh, he's amazing. And and it's just it's just a wonderfully made, wildly entertaining show. And I think one of the best on TV. All right. Next up here, we got um, uh, TJ Lynn. Oh, sorry. Um uh, missed one. Okay, here we go. Um, Sam O'Neill writes, Hey, John and all the JC crew, not sure if uh, you this will... Hmm. Not sure if you this will be a topic or brought up before uh, you get to the open questions, but I'm currently listening to the No Time to Die song, and I feel it's great for a Bond film. What are your thoughts? Yeah, we did go over that a little bit earlier. Um, again, I it, it will really all come down to what is the cold open? And does the song build off of and a reflection of what happens in the cold open? If it does, great. If it doesn't, like some of the great examples Rob gave earlier in the show, it'll be jarring. So uh, on its own, I think we all agreed in the room, on its own as a standalone song, it's a really nice song. But will it work as a Bond song? I think it really all comes down to how it works in the cold open. All right, Mr. T.J. Lynn also writes, uh, top five one-on-one -on -one dialogue scenes. Number five, Bale and Ledger in The Dark Knight. Number four, Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe in American Gangster. That's a good one. Number three, De Niro and Pacino in Heat. Uh, number two, Joaquin and Philip uh, Seymour Hoffman in The Master. That's a good one, too. Uh, number one, Fank, uh, Lagella and Michael Sheen in Frost Nixon. That's great, too. But I have to throw one in here, Rob. I got to throw one in here. Um... Why am I freezing? Uh, why am I freezing on uh, Firth, Colin Firth, and uh, who's the guy who played Casanova Frankenstein in um, in Mystery Men? Uh, Academy Award winning actor. Oh, um, oh why am I Jeffrey Rush? Yes. So Colin Firth and Jeffrey Rush in King's Speech. There, first of all, there are a number of scenes in there where the number of scenes in the movie where it's just the two of them sitting in a room talking. But there's one in particular where they're sitting in two leather uh, seats across from each other talking it's one of the most memorizing beautifully well done so i've got to throw that in there do you have a particular scene of like just two characters talking that come to mind jody foster and anthony hopkins in silence of the lambs Ooh, that's a great one. <laughs> oh my god that's a great one um okay let's move on here next one up is chris minor who writes uh hey john hope you and the crew are having an amazing or had an amazing weekend thank you so much uh what would or have an amazing weekend thank you what would you consider the bigger disappointment the lion king not winning oscar for best visual effects today or the phantom menace not winning in 1999 i see look that's where to me the phantom menace 
should have won Best Visual Effects in 99. The, the Phantom Menace, love or hate the movie, it was a step forward in visual effects in its totality, the likes of which at that time the world had never seen. Yeah, Bullet Time in Matrix was great. It was good. The visual effects in the Matrix were very, very good. Make no mistake about it. But too many people confuse the fact that they like the Matrix more as a movie. Yep. And so, so, so they go, also oh, give it visual effects. It doesn't matter. The visual effects in, in Phantom Menace, particularly in its year, in 1999, was stuff that just months earlier people would have thought impossible to do in a mm -hmm. film. Um, so I was tremendously disappointed that Lion King, which is clearly the best visual effect, in my opinion, the best visual effects done in a movie in history. But at the time, the leap forward that the visual effects, what ILM did with that movie was unprecedented. And I really felt, and I feel bad because this is me being guilty, Rob, of what I always tell people not to do, which is making excuses for other people's uh, actions. And, and so this is me doing it. I, I admit this is me doing it. But I clearly looked at that because George Lucas had so thumbed his nose at the industry that that was the industry thumbing their nose right back at George Lucas because it absolutely Matrix is clearly the better movie. But I'm sorry, the Phantom Menace should have won that in its sleep. But so I don't know, Rob, when you look at the two, which one do you think was the more disappointing? Uh, look, man, I, Ben Quadraneros is still my favorite pod racer. And I, <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, I, I, I know I love the Matrix and there was some groundbreaking stuff. But I do think overall, the Phantom Menace is a milestone in effects technology. And also that was it N64, the racer, the N64 had the pod racing game um, for that alone, man. Come on. Yeah, I, oh, and the sound work by Ben Burt in that was so fucking Dude, the pod good. race alone is a master. Talk about sound design and sound editing. Oh, it's Un one of the best things I've ever seen as far as sound. <laughs> Every I mean, single I pod racer had... Look, I don't even like the damn movie, but the pod race scene visually, uh, the, the, the sound of it, what Ben Burt did in that, oh, oh, so good, so good. Why don't they update that pod racing game? Oh, I hope they really should. They really should. Okay. Uh, Chris Miner writes, uh, hey, John, I hope. Oh, no, I already got that one. Sorry. Kara Black writes, uh, Gia Kino's uh, Batman theme in that footage sounds a little similar to the Imperial March. I don't know that I, you know what? I'm going to admit something here, though, Kara. I think I was just so fixated on what I was visually seeing. I don't know that I paid much attention to the audio, to be honest with you. Rob, did you? I did, because when it started, I'm like, this is a really cool piece of music. I was wondering, is it new? Was it written for the movie or was it a, a repurpose? I didn't recognize it right off the bat, but I like that piece of music. All right. Uh, Mr. T.J. Lynn writes, had you compiled a top of the decade list, would the King's Speech, Argo, Hacksaw Ridge be on it? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Ooh. I think I might say yes to all three. Actually, Hacksaw Ridge, you know, I watched it again recently. I am every once in a while you watch a movie that reminds you of what real what the real power of a movie can be. Hacksaw Ridge was one of those to me. Um, I, I just I was overwhelmed by the direction. Uh, Andrew Garfield was brilliant, in it, but just the story of it as well. It's just like you have to slap yourself. Through it. This was a true story, too, by the way. Uh, so I'm I you know what I'd have to sit down with an actual list so maybe not all three get on my list but I, I'm gonna lean and think maybe they all do I, I don't know Rob do any of these three make your top ten of the decade do you think um maybe I mean I really liked Argo and the King's Speech a lot uh, Hacksaw Ridge is a terrific film but I there's been a lot of great movies man I don't yeah. know if they'd make my top ten to be honest it's just been it was a great decade. It was a great decade. All right, uh, let's see. Luke one two three four writes Ben Affleck's first image, uh, Batman image was way better. Uh, I mean, again, it was just looking at a costume. I, I don't want to get too worked up over a costume. Is it still just a costume? So, I don't know. I think they were both pretty good. All right, Garrett Couch writes, Wow, that bat suit is on point. <laughs> there we go. Different opinions. That bat suit was on point, and I love the music. Uh, hope to hear more of it in a soundtrack. Warner Brothers. Take my money now. Again, I don't want to get... Look, I liked it, Rob. I liked it. But I still don't want to get too worked up over just something that's not even in the movie. And it's just a costume. But it was nice. 
It was good. I just don't want to get too worked up over it just yet. Uh, Suthius writes, uh, started the J-Law and Chris Pratt episode of Playground Insults. The Kevin Hart and Rock episode was hilarious. Those two are great jabbing each other. So, Rob, what happened the other day? We brought this up. There's this BBC show. Oh, I've watched it. You've watched it? So, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, where they you know, bring in celebrities to, talk, to promote an upcoming movie, but they'll often play this game with them where they got to try to make each other laugh by insulting them, right? And there have been the Jennifer Lawrence, Chris Pratt one is great. The um, Ryan Reynolds and uh, Josh, uh, 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 who played Thanos? Josh Brolin. Brolin. So why are freezing that? Uh, Ryan Reynolds and Josh Brolin when they were promoting Deadpool 2 was hilarious. Rob, so you've seen the show. Do you have any that really stand out to you? Um, no, but I, it's always, it's always fun to watch. Um, uh, I don't, there, you know what? There is one and I, I'm drawing a blank on what it, I, I, uh, I don't remember what it was, but I like those BBC one shows. There's the one guy with the beard and mustache that you know, always interviews people that, and then there's that show and I watch those that and Graham Norton. Yeah, Graham Norton does a really good job. Uh, all right, uh, next up, uh, Kosher Face writes, Now, nah, I still think Clooney's bat nipple suit is way better. Just kidding. I dig the Pat Bat suit. Uh, can't wait for the movie. Pat Bat's pretty good. I, I still kind of, I usually say Pattinson, or sorry, uh, Battinson is yeah. what I usually go with. Yeah. I usually go with Battinson. But Pat Bat, that's not bad either. Pat Bat's not bad either. I dig that. Ah, uh, nightmares, kosher face of the bat nipples. All right, kosher face also writes, oh, and by the way, to anyone that's a T-Mobile customer, you can get to see Sonic for $4 uh, for first ticket and a discount for more than one ticket, uh, but you must use it within within the Adam Tickets app. It expires by midnight on February 17th. That's a nice little tip. Kosher face, thank you for sharing that. So anybody out there um, that you're a T-Mobile customer, subscriber and you want to go see that movie thank you kosher face for throwing that in there and by the way i should also mention this rob i know a lot of people are looking forward to onward i am one of them opens march 6th however i just noticed quite by accident on amc's website that they just launched that there will be a one-time screening on the on march or on uh, february 29th or 28th, 28th or 29th. Is, is this a leap year? year? If this is a leap year, it'll be February 29th. I believe it might be a leap year. Anyway, uh, last day of April, they're doing a one screening week in advance screening of it. So check your local theater listings to see if your local theater will be, will be showing that because um, I got my tickets right away. Like I got them right away because I'm very, very excited to see that. So kosher face, thank you for keeping everybody up to date on that. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, Tim Platt writes, Clone Wars helped me get a greater appreciation for the prequels and has some of my favorite characters in all of Star Wars and I can't believe it's back next week. I haven't been this excited since opening night of The Force Awakens like irrationally so. Yeah, Clone Wars is not a show that I enjoyed. I didn't. I don't hate it though. I don't hate it, but I don't. I don't enjoy it all that much. But it definitely, definitely has its fans. It absolutely has its fans, and there are a lot of people. You're not alone, Tim. A lot of people I know are actually very, very excited about it returning next week. Uh, Rob, were you much of a Clone Wars? I am. Guy? A Clone and Wars how are you fan. feeling about the return? I of it? cannot wait. I, the trailer has me all ghibli. It looks really good. I really like those characters. Uh, I have the first six seasons on Blu-ray. I am a big fan. All right. Uh, let's keep moving here. Josh Bing writes, the cowl on the new suit reminds me of Batman Year One. Yeah, yeah the cowl actually kind of does. Uh, personally, I'm going to give it a shot despite all the negative reactions. That's the funny thing. It's really not that negative. Like we did the poll. I expected the people who hated be much more than 6.9%. I thought it'd be in its 20 or 30s, but like, yeah, the poll is only 6.9%. Again, I think the negative reactions are just the louder ones. I, I think that's probably what it is. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix Joker looked different than any iteration to, but it worked well for what the story they were going to tell. Completely agree, Josh. So now let's see if it works. But again, while I liked it, I'm not going to get too excited because it doesn't mean the movie's going to be good. But... Hey, if we're just talking about the costume, I thought it worked. Josh Bing also writes, uh, the more I watch it, the more I like the suit. That's always a good thing. Magic K writes, Netflix renewed Lucifer for season six. That's the report. Just keep in mind. And obviously, I'm very excited about that. But do keep in mind, that has not been 
um, that has not been confirmed. So let's just so let's not get too terribly excited. It hasn't been confirmed, but that is what TV Line is reporting. Jay Meister twenty five writes: Is Warner Brothers chasing the intensity and uh, artistic style of Daredevil? No, uh, I hope so because that is an untapped cinematic goldmine. Uh, learn from each other, DC and Marvel. True. I mean, a lot of people listen. I remember Rob when Daredevil came out. A lot of people were saying that Daredevil was taking influence from Batman, the darker right. Batman yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, which, but I don't know. Like, other than the color red, yeah. I, did you see anything no. there? I mean, it, it was a panning shot of literally a guy just standing. The camera's moving up from his his chest up to his his face. I mean, what did that say? Nothing. You couldn't even. There wasn't even enough lighting to get a lot of detail of the costume either. But it was a great first look. It was a great hint. I still have no idea what to expect from the whole thing when we see it revealed in all of its glory. And uh, I don't think just because it was red, it means they're taking a page from Daredevil. Yeah, I agree. All right, guys. Just so you know, we're just about out of time here, so I'm going to fly through a couple more, and then all the rest. Don't you worry, guys. We're going to do a companion video later, either tonight or tomorrow, to get to all the questions that you guys sent in. We're, it's just that we're just about out of time here right now. Uh, Tim Duplisa writes, my favorite guilty pleasure is Eddie and the Cruisers. What are your thoughts on it? I have to watch it every time it comes on. I even like number two. I liked Eddie. It's one of those films I watched when I was really young, when I was really young, but... I remember I liked it, but I haven't watched it in probably in the like in the last ten years or so. Rob, do you have memories of Eddie Dude, and the Cruisers? Eddie and the Cruisers rules. <laughs> Dark side's coming now. Nothing is real. She'll never know just how I feel. From out of the shadows, she walks like a dream. Make me feel crazy. Make me feel so mean. Sorry. Uh, we could just do our whole show with that. There you go. I think tomorrow's show could just on the dog side. <laughs> I love Eddie and the Cruisers. I, I love that John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band. That soundtrack rules. Uh, all right, here. Uh, last two questions of the day. Russell Amador writes, uh, Hey, John, not going to lie. The score that came with the quick Batman tee sounded amazing. I'm curious to see how Robert Pattinson takes on the Dark Knight, uh, take on the Dark Knight turns out. It looks as if he'll be a leaner version. Apparently, he'll be in a, uh, he'll be in his second year as a Craig Crusader. Again, nothing really confirmed, I don't think, but I, I've, I've heard different whispers. Clearly, they went for a younger Batman. And again, I'm okay with a leaner Batman as long as you got a great actor playing it and as long as he's clearly in great shape. Um, otherwise, it won't work. But I am absolutely fascinated, Russell, as well, to see what they're going to do with that and, and what his iteration is going to be. All I know is that it'll be perfectly acted. That's all I know. The movie might not be great. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But I know that's going to be greatly acted because Robert Pattinson is a great actor. All right, final question of the day. Mr. 47 writes, can you imagine if the Batman had the tone of Prisoners 2013, the mystery, hard-hitting, detective, noir-style film? That would be amazing. It would, but but here's the one thing that I think people got to keep in mind. And so let me caution that it's 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 okay to take the influence of it, but to be just like it, no. And here's why: I believe Rob, one of the, we've talked about this before. I believe one of the reasons that Superman Returns didn't get a ton of love was because that I felt as a movie, it's a quite a good movie but it wasn't a very good comic book movie. And I think when people are going to a movie called Superman, they go in with certain expectations. You also you want to subvert expectations, sure, but you also want to meet some of those expectations at the same time. And I think if people went to a Batman movie, yeah, a lot of those elements like of, of uh, prisoners and stuff like that absolutely have some of that, but you also are going to have to have in a great... Batmobile chase. You got to have in like Batman wrecking shop, fighting a bunch of thugs or a couple of key bosses or whatever. You you also have to have that in there because there's just that built-in expectation, and you want to subvert it a little bit by bringing some elements, but you can't go all the way that way. I don't think without disappointing a lot of the audience. I don't know, Rob. What do you think about no, that? I totally agree. It's not like I mean, I would love to see the Batman version of Seven. You know, two cops going after a serial killer. I mean, go that dark. You know, Batman up the, down the river, uh, the heart of darkness, you know. But nobody's going to, like, people would be disappointed no matter how good that movie was. You know, like you said, John, you've got to have the Batman flavor of it all. 
I agree. Batman flavored all. Well said. All right, listen, guys. For everybody else who still has questions outstanding waiting to be answered from Sam O'Neill, Mr. 47, Kong's agent. Oh, I can't wait to read that one. Kong's agent and everybody else afterwards. We unfortunately have run out of time here for today, but don't worry. Either a little bit later today or earlier tomorrow, I'm going to do a companion video getting to all the questions that you guys have sent in, and they're all going to get answered properly in a video. Keep your guys' eyes open for that. All right, guys. That will do it for today's installment of the John Campia Show. Thank you so much for being here. Special thanks to uh, Aaron Cummings, who was here a little bit earlier. Thanks, of course, to Robert Meyer Burnett. Thank you to all of you guys for making this show a part of your day. We are truly honored that you take some of your time out to join us and the rest of the film fan community here as well. Big thank you to Robert Meyer Burnett for being here. Rob, in the meantime, where can people follow you and your online adventures? Well, you can follow me on Twitter at BurnettRM. Follow me on Instagram at Robert Meyer Burnett, or follow me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work, and my show, Rob Observations, the show about something. All right, and we'll see you, of course, back on Monday. And guys, a special thank you to all of you who sent in questions, not just because you gave us great fun things to talk about, but also because you supported the channel while you were doing it. And all of us here on the John Kempe YouTube channel, thank you all very, very much for that. Again, guys, keep your guys' eyes open for the companion video. Open mic will be tomorrow as well. And then the John Kempe Show returns, of course, on Monday. We hope to see you guys here. Hey, listen, guys, while you're here, take a second, click the thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That'll do it for us for now guys thank you so much for being here and being a part of the show today my name is john campia and until next time bye bye